Welcome to another episode of 177 Nations of Tasmania. So what do you think of when you hear the name Barbados? Perhaps a lush tropical island paradise with palm trees and white sandy beaches. Or if you're a similar generation to me, you perhaps associate it with the world-class cricketers such as Sobers, Marshall or Ghana. Or for the younger generation, the association may be with the pop star Rihanna. Anyway, it's a long way from Tasmania in every sense, and so that may make you wonder, what would a Barbadian be doing in Tasmania? Well, my guest for this episode, Donna, is going to answer this question. She came to Tasmania from Barbados to study psychology 18 years ago and ended up staying. While most of her current work involves psychology, she also has developed a little side business making skin products for people with darker skin after herself struggling with the dryness of the Tasmanian climate. So lots of interesting things to discuss and learn about in this episode. I lived in the country and where I grew up. So I went to the local primary school which was right next to a church and um, I could walk to school. Um, I knew all my neighbours, spent time with them. Um, the old lady next door actually had the same birthday that I did okay. so I was fascinated with her and she was blind so I used to go and sit and just probably talk her head off and she but she was lonely but and I was just fascinated. She was so interesting and I felt that connection because we had the same birthday. I think because most of the other adults were busy working and because she was blind, she couldn't. So I had a captive audience. I just loved to talk to people. And so I just go next door and talk to her. So I think, yeah, it was good company. Yeah. I think I annoyed her a little bit, but (laughs) I mean, it was hard to get rid of me. One of my earliest memories, um, my nan, well, my mum's nan, she worked at um, the local pl- plantation and on Fridays they'd get paid and she'd take me with her um, to the plantation house and it'd be like the big yard with all the equipment and everything. And I was quite an inquisitive kid. And while they were standing in line and chatting, I'd go exploring and... I remember wanting to use a toilet one day and she said to me it was down the bottom of the yard and I thought, well, I'm too little to go there. And I remember walking up to the house and knocking on the door and when the housekeeper came, I said to her, can I use a toilet? And she sent me to the other one. I said, no, Mr. Corbin said I was too little to go there on my own and he said I should use the one in the house. (laughs) And she believed me and she let me there. And then every Friday I'd go in and explore the house. And they had these massive um, windows that you could sit in. And if the curtains were pulled, nobody could find you. And I I started bringing books and I'd go sit in those windows and read and listen to the sound so that I'd know when my nan was ready. And I promised myself I'm going to build a big house with a window seat so (laughs) I can sit and read when I grow up. So that's one of my earliest memories. I think I was I was really little, so my books weren't very big. So they finished before my nan was ready. <laughs> Must yeah. have been about three or four. Something. Oh, okay. So not the books weren't big books, and it was just a fascination I had. And I thought I'm going to build a big house with a window seat so I can read in it. And what, the area where you lived, what sort of things did the people people do? What did they live from? Because it was country, most people had manual labor jobs, mm-hmm. but. There was lots of fruit. Everybody had a little veggie patch and there was lots of fruit trees and things like that. So I remember in summer holidays, we'd all go just walking everywhere and picking everything and spend the whole day outside and come back with a very full tummy at the end of the day because we've just raided everybody's fruit trees. What what was school like on Barbados? What what are your sort of memories of the early days of school? I actually loved school. I, I loved learning. I liked being first and things like that. Um, I remember because 
I'm a book nerd, so <laughs> um, I remember we had mobile libraries, so that because okay. um, at a small ish school, so they'd have the state library would have mobile um library vans that would come to each school, so that you could have a variety of books. And I remember my neighbor was the librarian, so you'd go in and they said, oh, you know, based on your age, you could only get. A certain number of books or a certain type of books but because my neighbor was a librarian she let me choose books and give to her and she signed them out in her name for me so that I remember and then I remember we'd have speech days and things like that I'd always get to be a part of it in the drama group mm -hmm. I remember playing the triangle for my primary school because I'm not musical but I play the triangle it was pretty cool and I remember doing like spelling bees. Yeah, I had a really great relationship with my teachers and things like that. Was high school very different? Did you did you were you able to stay in the same area or did you? No, so um, we do exams at the end of primary school, and um, so I went to a high school in the city, um, which was quite different. And I went to a high school that had kids from a lot of private schools or parents from professional backgrounds so it was completely different to the school I had before but it it was still good um yeah I, I enjoyed high school as well I have a lot of positive memories from high school and and did you have like a, a favorite subject or, or some area of interest that developed in your high school time I liked languages mm -hmm. French I did French up straight up to grade 10 so I was always fascinated with languages. I loved history, but I just didn't like having to remember dates and things like that. <sighs> so I've always had a fascination with people and languages and culture. Is there a person at that, during that period of your life who you think was a, a big influence on you or had a big impact on, on you at that time? In different areas, yeah. During that time, so my high school days, my dad had a supervisor and she didn't have kids and she took an interest in me and she'd always push me. At the time, I, I hated it because I felt like she didn't think I was good enough. But looking back, I know that that's not what it was. Um, and my friends and I, we joked that she was my fairy godmother. But she had a keen interest and she'd like encouraged me to do things and she pushed me um, and that was really good. What well, what do you think was the, the, the biggest lesson you learned from her? To never doubt myself and always never think that something is beyond me. Mm -hmm. And she could see my potential and she reached for it and pushed me for it and saw, yeah, t to always see potential in people and, and to help them realise their potential, even if they don't. And what did you do um, when you finished high school? So I had a baby at 17. but okay. <laughs> And no, I went to... I went to uni, started with chemistry and then realised that I didn't really like it as much as I thought. And then I started psychology. And what, uh, what attracted you to psychology? So when I got pregnant, I was 16 and everyone around me was, you know, they shared their disappointment and it, it, the messages that I got from people were the, you know, that I messed up my life. And I, I had to see a social worker because of my age. And the first thing she asked me was, what did I want to do? And how was I feeling? And I was really confused why she'd want to know how I was feeling. And because nobody actually asked me that question before. And I was like, what do you mean? How do I feel? And it, it was quite refreshing to have somebody to support you, even though you'd, you'd done something that you knew you shouldn't have done. And someone who didn't focus on, oh, this was a big mistake. But was like, okay, here we are. How do you feel? How can I help you? And that pushed me into that was a deciding factor for me I wanted to have a career where I could help other young people who got themselves in a pickle and needed to have somebody to believe in them and help to pull them out of that pickle and help them to realize that whatever they were going through I feeling was important and valuable when you started studying you had a young child then yeah so how did you cope with that it was, but um, I've always had a really good friendship base. And so because I had my son at the age I did, 
all of my friends are really supportive. And so it, it was a team effort. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I always say to people, he was raised by the village. Mm-hmm. And my, fr- my friends are really supportive. Mm-hmm. My parents are supportive as well, too, financially, because obviously initially I went back to do year 11 and 12. But yeah, my friends are a really big support, like 11 and year 11 and 12 and uni, my friends pitched in to help as much as they could. And is that sort of fairly usual for in as Barbadian culture that you have that kind of supportive culture? Yeah, it's a community spirit. So for example, like I was the first child born in the area I lived and so ended up with lots of aunties and uncles because mm. I was the first kid of, of my generation really in that little area where we lived. So it was pretty cool getting all that attention. I was the first grandchild from my from my mum obviously because she knew it's only her but the first granddaughter from my dad so there was lots of like I have lots of aunties and uncles yeah. and lots of attention <laughs> yeah I did my bachelor's in Barbados and then I wanted to do my master's and when I did my thesis in my undergrad my supervisor was actually from England and when I went to get a reference from him he said to me the best programs are in England Australia and New Zealand so I'm not going to sign it for you to go and do it anywhere else you need an international accredited degree and I'm like why I'd never live outside of Barbados but he said no I'm not going to do a reference for you unless you do this so another adult who pushed me anyway so I was like fine (laughs) So uh, there was a scholarship for New Zealand and I applied for that and I didn't get it. And my partner at the time said to me, well, if you were willing to go to New Zealand, why not try Australia? And I'm like, okay. And I did. And I got into UTAS. And um, what did you know about it beforehand? Nothing. (laughs) So it was interesting because it's funny when people do research, what they research and... It's very interesting because a lot of people came to me and said, did you know they killed all their aboriginals? And I'm like, okay. And I didn't want it to discourage my son. So we did it as a project and we started actively researching Tasmania and the schools that he was going to be at and everything. And then we made it a point to plan for lots of things. So we chose a footy team and all sorts of things. Yep. (laughs) Well, that shows you did research hard. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we, I was like, footy, and we actually researched what it was and we chose footy teams and everything. So we had footy teams when we came here. Okay. Can I ask who you chose? Oh, yeah. So my son chose Port, no, he chose the Crows, Adelaide Crows, and I chose Port Adelaide only because I like their colours. Okay. <laughs> well, that's, well, that's as good a reason as any, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, so you were you you did quite a lot of preparation then. Yeah, my son was twelve, turning thirteen, and I wanted it to be comfortable for him. And initially, we'd only come here for my degree. Actually, today I came here today, eighteen years ago. Oh well, congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and we were only coming for the two-year program. Um, so I wanted to make sure it was a, something exciting for him. So we did. So every day we spend a bit of time doing some research on. Tasmania and Hobart and all sorts of things and Australia in general. And when you got here, was it sort of what you expected or were there some surprises? Lots of surprises. The first one being the weather. They said, I read, and then they need to come, like, fix their tourist information. It says there are four (laughs) distinct seasons and they gave time periods. And I got here and realised that there's no such thing as distinct seasons in Tasmania. It all just happens any time of the year. (laughs) Actually, it happens any time of the day. The other thing that um, I noticed about Tasmania is it reminded me a lot of Barbados when I was a kid. So I did linguistics, like I said, that, that I also did linguistics as part of a minor in linguistics because I love people and culture and language and the linguist in me was totally attracted to the fact that Tasmania had a lot of the culture that I grew up with as a kid um, because we also had convict settlement, mm, yeah. um, very small, but there was lots of similarities in places, like yeah. place names and a lot of words and it's like culture thing. So that was a bit of a shock. What were maybe, it was maybe one of the most challenging things to adjust to 
when you maybe the first year or two. It's very interesting, but the language was a big deal. Living here for such a long time, I realized, and like I said, the linguist in me realizes how unique Australian language is, and Australians do not realize that. So, for yeah. example, I remember the first week of study, um, one of the lecturers said, we'll meet in the Arvo, and I was... <laughs> I was like, where? And I was looking on my map and I couldn't find the Arvo. And, but this Malaysian student asked, like, where's the Arvo? And everybody started to laugh. And I thought, thank God I'm not the only foreign student here. And I was like, it's not a place. It's the afternoon. And I wrote that down. And then every week I'd make a list of all the words I, I learned and I'd send it to one of the persons who did linguistics with me. And I said, these are really cool. And the language was interesting. <laughs> and I guess because I was doing psychology I needed to understand what people were saying to me so that that didn't become a barrier so I had to make a very concerted effort to learn the language pronunciation because mm -hmm. you know I was going to be doing IQ testing so people needed to understand me so I was glad I did linguistics for that for being able to understand things like intonations and that and how important they were and how they changed how a word sounded and I think Barbados is unique in the sense that we're in the most easterly Caribbean island and so we have a different history from some of the other so for example that convict history I'm not quite sure if there's any other Caribbean island that shares that and also we don't have any indigenous influence in our language because they were gone pretty quickly and then we had because we had a convict in port and then they did slavery by the time slavery ended we had and no mountains so nowhere to go there was a bigger population of white than some of the other places that were bigger and different so not just a different population but it wasn't just the um richer whites it was poor whites as well from um the convicts mm. and so by the time slavery ended there were like tons of plantations and I found that fascinating during linguistics to realize the smaller plantations were from the convicts after they served their time they got a bit of money and they bought a handful of slaves and so by the time slavery ended there was nowhere to run so people ended up working on the plantation so my great-grandmother she still worked on a plantation mm. with the one I went to and so our influence of our language, we, we've got a lot more of that. That's why I think our language is different. Our accent is a bit more washed out than some of the other Caribbean mm -hmm. islands because we, our blacks would, would have mixed a lot. Mm. So like Jamaican, that their accents are probably closer sound into Africans than Barbados does. And plus Barbados was only ever colonized by British, whereas some of the other islands like St. Lucia, for example, were colonized by French and English, Jamaica by Spanish and English, Barbados, we only had British. So, and yeah, and when the slavery ended, um, the freed kids were taught English from missionaries so I, there are lots of churches a lot of schools were established around churches so my primary school was right next to a church was your plan to go back to Barbados yes, yes. I came on a student visa and I was going to go back um I because I was doing um a course plus research um degree I had to do prac, I had to do coursework, so I didn't really have time to write up my thesis, so I re-enrolled for another semester, and I did have plans of going home after that, but I actually really enjoyed living here, and I remember close to the time my visa was going to be up, my son came to me and said to me, Mom, I have so many friends, do we have to go back? I said, oh, I'll think about it. But I had been thinking about it for a long time and I was okay. worried about, it was really hard for him to leave friends and mm. families. And we'd only packed up 23 kilos anyway to come. Mm. Why did you choose uh, to come to Tasmania to study actually? Okay, so Barbados is a sort of a Bruni island. Mm -hmm. and so I I was bringing my son with me and I just needed to come to some place small and Utah is one of the smallest universities that's not very regional so that's why I came to Tasmania maybe if I'd known about the weather I wouldn't have but I'm <laughs> glad I did anyway 
So it was a bit more of a easier transition coming to a smaller yeah. place than if you'd gone to a big big city. Yeah. Or otherwise you would have had to go to a regional place yeah. like Toowoomba or yeah. Albury. I, I did get accepted to a uh, University of Newcastle in Armadale, but that seemed a little farther away. To my little Barbadian mind, it seemed it worth it. However, it seemed like it was really little in comparison to where everything was. And so I chose Hobart. It was a major city, but it was close to everything. And the university was in the middle of the city. And I thought, yeah, this was, yeah, I could do yeah. this. And so what kept you here? Was it was it mainly your son or were there other factors? No. Um, so I'm some of the Adventists, so we came into church community. So my son went to the school and um, my church community was really supportive and like, we found a new church community here and everything. And so we made lots of friends and fitted in really well and then I got a job and I actually enjoyed it. Like one of the, the things that I love were that people were really friendly and helpful. Like I remember being at the bus stop and meeting this old lady they call Ivy. And I'd see her like once a week and she started talking to me and I told her I had a son and she said, oh, he's so far away from his nan, I'll be his nan. And that was it. And we'd go visit her once a week until she had to move to Queensland because of the weather. So she had gone sick and we didn't get a chance to like go and talk to her before she left because I had exams. But yeah, for the first year we were here, he had a nan Mm -hmm. called Ivy. So you kind of found a bit of a community here to connect with. Yeah, and it was it was very friendly. Um, life was not too fast. I wasn't worried about my son getting caught up and going here a while. And yeah, life was easy in Tassie, and it, it was it was great. I, I loved it. And plus, like I said, I'm fascinated with history and people and languages and culture and so. And moving to Australia, I realized that Australia is full of people and languages and culture. So. Mm. My fascination grew, and yeah, I loved it. And so, how did you get your first job here after you um you graduated? What was it? <laughs> yeah, so there were only two foreign students in my group, and so I knew that everybody else had connections. And so, the first year I worked as a research assistant at the uni, but then I thought I really needed to get into psychology because everybody else has connections here. And I couldn't find a job. And then there was an ad for a school psychologist in Devonport. Mm. And I applied for it. And they said, do you live in Hobart? I said, yep. She said, so how are you going to get here? I said, I'll drive up. She said, why? I said, because I need to get my foot in the door. And I really, I said, I'm willing to do it. And they gave me the job. And so I drove up at the beginning of the week and I came home every Wednesday Initially, I went up on a Sunday night for the first month or so, and then when I got accustomed to it, I'd leave home at 4.30 every Monday morning and go wow. straight to school. And then I'd leave school at 4 on Wednesday evenings and come home. But then, um, because I was already working in the department, if someone had to go to Malta to um, on family business, and it was too small of a place to put someone as a contract. But because I was in the system already and they knew I was traveling, they offered me that for the two weeks. And that's how it started. And I started getting like if somebody was off sick, I'd get to do their bits down here because I was already in the system. And then eventually after after the winter term, it was just too much. And I just stayed down here full time. But because I'd had all these little jobs here and there, it was easy for them to just find somewhere for me down here. So I kind of worked my way into the system. I worked in school psychology for two years. Um, Then I was in private practice from 2010. And in that time, I worked at Headspace. And I currently am back in private practice from 2016. But I've, I work one day a week at a, as a school psychologist at a private school, the school my son went to. So I come full circle. I was a parent and now I'm a school psychologist there. And, yeah, the rest is private practice. I work one day a week in New Norfolk um, at the medical centre there. And I'm registered through NDIS as well too. So. And 
what what would you say is the thing that you like best about your job? The people. Yeah. <laughs> so my fascination with people and history goes to my job. Plus, it's quite fulfilling. Like I said, um, I got into it to help people when they're at that point where they need someone to believe in them, to validate them, and then to go forward. So I find it quite rewarding to be able to be with people and offer them hope mm-hmm. in a practical way that will help them in to do whatever they need to do and I like the variety of what I do so you know on Wednesdays I'm a school psychologist and on Thursdays I work in a medical center and then the rest of the week I work all over the place so I enjoy the all the differences that I encounter and not two days are ever the same. And what would you say are the biggest maybe some of the differences between people here and people in Barbados? Well, the first difference I had to do was color. Mm -hmm. So when I first came that long ago, I was a massive minority. At UTAS, in my um, clinical psychology course, I was the only black person for three intakes. My son was the only black boy in high school. I chose a small school because we were coming to a big place. I chose a small private school. At my church, we were the only black family until the middle of the year and another family came. In most of my practice, except when I did my practice for education, I was the only black person on staff. So that took a bit of getting used to being a minority after I was a majority for the rest mm. of my life. Did you feel, did that make you feel self conscious or did that, or did it just, well, how did it, how yeah, did very you feel? Self, <laughs> very, very self conscious. And it's interesting because, because I was a minority here, people, and still now, people chose not to call me black. And they it was just interesting listening to okay. people try to describe me. I was colored. I was dark. I was, and I said to them, oh, that's one of those things, colored. That's something that means something totally different in Barbados. Okay. Colored were the people who, you know, the plantation owner had kids with the slave workers and those kids were considered colored they weren't accepted as white nor were they kind of accepted as black and they were colored so it wasn't something a good thing necessarily right colored or mulattoes they are called and so initially when people started calling me colored I'd, I'd still smile because for me back home being colored meant something completely different and I was definitely not colored <laughs> but that was something really fascinating i guess because my linguistics is that where people chose not to call me black i'm like look i've been black for all my life so i think you should call me black oh challenges you asked me earlier one of the challenges i found was taking care of my skin and my hair Mm. the the dryness of tasmania yeah just awful on my skin and my hair and it was really hard to find stuff that took care of my skin or my hair well that's a nice segue to ask you more about this little small business that you yes. have because that's sort of how i discovered you in a way <laughs> yeah so after struggling for so many years in 2017 i decided well first my friend one of my friends she started she did a course in soaps and so I went, wanted to buy her when she graduated, when she finished the course, I wanted to buy her like a whole gift. And when I went on this website, I found a, a kit, a soap making kit and I tried it. And I found for the first time, I, I used soap that didn't draw up my skin. I'm like, oh, this is amazing. So I started making soaps for us. And then I thought, if I'm going to make soaps, I should try stuff for my hair. So I researched all of the different things that I could use. And I started making my own hair stuff and then oh let's try the skin and so yeah over the next few years I have made hair butter body butter and soaps and I'd started sharing them with my friends and they said you should market this this is good and I thought oh no no they should you should though because we have the same struggle I'm pretty sure every black person here has the same struggle as you did and so I thought okay fine and then I've recently started to take that advice and came up with the name Beige Odds, so Beige and Aussie skincare, and started to market those. So I have hair butter, I have body butter, I have soaps. 
so because I'm busy with my other job, I yeah. haven't quite got, got into marketing. I'm not very good on social media. So, yeah. but I'm trying to now, and I think I, I did get an Instagram page so I can start marketing. And I've decided from the first of February to really start pushing it. So I spent the last few months just buying up stock and making stuff and yeah. getting the website and all that so that I can start marketing. But all the people who have used the stock have had positive feedback. And if, like, some, for example, the body butter was melting when it got hot, but I've changed the formula. I've used my love of chemistry to work out <laughs> to change the formula to make it nicer. So I've changed the formula and I'm going to kind of start actively yeah. going for it again. Because, like I said, my friends who've used the stuff, they've given positive feedback. And I've had a few people buy stuff and I've got positive feedback from them. And, you know, I've encouraged them to give me feedback on things that aren't working and I can improve on. And I've taken that on board and kind of done a bit of a rebrand. And there's a lot more people in Tasmania itself who are black or dark skinned than there used to be. Yes. Um, oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> The biggest thing about living in Tasman is that it's so far away from home. So if anything yeah. happens, it takes forever to get home. But also the food. Because it's a totally different climate, all of the things that I love aren't naturally grown here. Um, and that's why my son moved to Queensland because he says it reminds him more of home. He's on the Sunshine Coast and he says the weather and the food and everything. So like... Every time I go home, I make it a foodie trip. I just eat mm -hmm. everything. And then when you do have to buy things there, because they have to be imported in smaller quantities, they're more expensive. So, yeah, my two biggest challenges in Tasmania are the fact that Australia is so far away and that the climate in Tasmania doesn't allow for me to grow all the things that I love eating. And so what would you eat in Barbados? What, what would be your favourite food? Uh dishes or foods so our national dish is called cuckoo it's made with maize flour and okras and there's a special way and my nan showed me the my dad's mom showed me the cheap way to make it so it doesn't have lumps in it so and and i made it for my nigerian friend the other day and i said to her the way i made it is not necessarily the standard way so if you go to any other person's house and they make it don't say that that's not how i did it this is not the way to do it <laughs> This is just a cheap way to make sure it comes out creamy. I love the fact that you could get fish and it wasn't an arm and a leg. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, fish is really expensive. Things like mangoes and avocados. The avocados here are very tiny and they're hit and miss. Whereas the avocados at home are like the size of your hand. And yeah. they're always nice and they're very flavorful, full of flavor. Very, very flavorsome. Growing up, my nan, everybody had their little veggie patch and all that. I wasn't interested in doing any of those things, so I didn't quite learn how to do a lot of those things. But having come here, though, and, you know, people grow things, I've learned since I've come here, I can make, like, I've learned how to bottle stuff, and I've got a dehydrator, and, you know, I do stew truths and all sorts of things, simply from having friends who've done them. I, and I often make my, my, my pasta sauces from scratch because... Somebody taught me how to do that. And mm. so my son teases me and said to me, I've become domesticated. <laughs> I said to him, well, after I finished my master's, it was lots of years of, oh, what do I do with all this time? And so I started cooking. <laughs> and what are the staples in Barbados? Things like breadfruit, which I haven't eaten in ages because it was the wrong season when I went home. So like yams, cassava, okay. edos, which they call taro. <laughs> You mentioned that you've met some people, got to know some people here from other Caribbean yeah. islands. How did you meet them? Okay, so my solution friend, I have so I've got friends from all over the place. And initially, when I first came, because you're black and you see another black person, like, oh, and there's the nod, <laughs> and you get to okay. know people. And we talked about family. So the family that moved. That, that started going to my church like they're like my closest nieces and nephews now and for some of them I'm a closest auntie because physic physically than some of their actual relatives because they don't have many relatives living in Tasmania so one of my friends from Zimbabwe I think she 
was a PhD student. She said, I've met someone from St. Lucia. I was like, no, you haven't. She's like, yes, I have. And her and she told her friend the same thing. I met someone from Barbados. She's like, no. She said, I'll invite you both to my house for dinner. And she did. And we met each other and, like, it was amazing. Yeah. And then she invited us over to her house and we met a Jamaican family. And then we found out there was another Jamaican family. So we had them over at our house and then we met them and, that, that's what we do. We, we find another person and we have a social <laughs> event so we can meet them and incorporate them in. So, but initially, yeah, we hadn't met anybody else from the Caribbean for ages. So it was amazing not having a Caribbean family to now having one. When was the last time you went back to Barbados? Oh, I, just, I went home in October last okay. year. But before then, July 2020, no, July 2011. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's been quite a long time between yeah. visits. And did you notice much change? Yes. So even yep. the first, so we went back and we were here for four years and then we went back and it was very interesting. We were in the airport, my son and I, and this was meant to be an inside thought, but it wasn't. I said, oh, well, there's so many black people. And he's like, mom, you just <laughs> said that out loud. But it, I'd gotten so accustomed to being a minority he had walked into the airport and there's like all these black people around me and I was like and I didn't realize how much I'd gotten accustomed visually to yeah. being a minority to the fact that it was the first thing that came to my mind as soon as I walked through the airport <laughs> I think I embarrassed my son a little bit but it, I didn't mean to oh it's just, I mean it's just such a funny thing to say when you think about it, yes. isn't it? but it was because I don't know it was the first thing I noticed when I stepped through the airport yeah. Because I'd, I'd been so accustomed being a minority and not seeing another black person for days and weeks sometime that see, being among so many, I'm like, oh, well, this is different. <laughs> <laughs> but so in the three visits I've had in the last 18 years, so 2009, 2011 and 2022, America has a bigger influence. And in, so I, I grew up with a very British influence. Mm -hmm. America, it's a very Americanized influence now. So the foods have changed, a lot of fast food, okay. like iced coffees and that sort of thing as well. And people are less into growing things and all that. I don't know, it feels... And it's very busy. Everybody's busy. And the traffic was horrendous. And I think that's because I'm accustomed to Tasmania. And it was like, so I'd walk everywhere. I'd take the bus because traffic was just terrible. And then I stopped leaving home at Picar altogether. <laughs> but, yeah, it was really different. That And there were lots of different places that weren't there before. So, wow. And I found that it's interesting because living here for so long, visually, I'd go home and things are completely different. Like, oh, the buses, the bus stops are a different color. I'd, it doesn't feel as friendly and homey like it did before. Well, obviously with the people I know, but just in general, it didn't. Not that it has stopped being, but the, the cozy openness I grew up with isn't there. I think, like I said, that big change from that British influence to that American fast external mm. environment, I, I can notice that. When I, when I got back home now. For you, what's the best thing about living in Tasmania? Believe it or not, the thing that I hated most is the thing I love most, the, the weather. Okay. So, so more often than not, it's cool. And you can put layers on, but you can't take them off. That's you my don't argument. Have to, yeah, you don't have to compete with the humidity. There's no traffic unless you live in Kingston and the other side not that. But having said that, I remember going to Sydney a few years ago and I saw the bus. I ran to the bus stop. I walked for 20 minutes and I got to my destination before the bus even got to the end of the street. So mm. we don't have traffic here. But I also love that it's close by. Like you can drive anywhere in a day, really. People are so friendly and random people will talk to you and people just say good day. People help you and that's good because... I suck with directions and even with the GPS, I get lost occasionally and I'm quite happy to stop and ask for directions and, you know, I love going walking and things like that and it feels safe. I don't have to worry about not getting back, you know, I don't do stupid things, but yeah. <laughs> and I love the, you know, in summer you drive along and there's a little stall outside somebody's house with flowers or fruit or vegetables and you can just drop some money in and get it and I love that.